Hello everyone, I'm Sam Lemley, Curator of Special Collections at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. Welcome to the second episode of Coffee with the Curator, a video series in which I share some of the many fascinating artifacts and books that are held in Carnegie Mellon's uh, Special Collections. Uh, in this episode, we'll be looking at an early cryptographic technology or instrument called a cipher disk. Um, these are relatively common in printed books of the 16th and 17th centuries, um, but they're not very widely known about. Um, taken together, right, in their thousands, though, I think they illustrate a really rich and fascinating history of cryptography, particularly as it was practiced in the Renaissance. Um, to narrow our focus, uh, we'll be looking at a set of cipher disks that appears in one of my favorite books at CMU, uh, and that's this book here. Uh, it's titled De Furtivis Literarum, uh, which basically translates as On Secret Writing. Uh, it was written by Gian Battista della Porta, who was an occult scientist in the Renaissance in Italian. Uh, it was originally published in 1563, but as you can see, this is a copy of the second edition, published in London in 1591. Um, so I'll return to that book in a moment, um, but I want to point out first that there's actually an interactive component to this video that requires downloading a PDF, uh, and I'll link that here. So this PDF is a reproduction of one of the cipher disks that appears in Della Porta's book, uh, and to work with it you'll need to print it out of course, you'll need, you'll need scissors, a needle and thread, or a brass fastener, uh, and some patience to put it together. So we'll return to that in a moment. Um, so the topic of ciphers and cryptography is especially important at CMU, uh, which, you know, because Special Collections holds a growing number of books and artifacts from the history of cryptology, which is basically the science and study of ciphers, cipher systems, and cryptographic machines. Um, so by, well of, by way of one well-known example, we have two Enigma machines, one three-rotor model and another four-rotor model, both of which were donated by Pamela McCordick in memory of her husband Joseph Traub in 2018. Uh, the story of how the Enigma machine was deciphered, uh, first by Marian Rzewski of Pol Polish intelligence in the 1930s and then later by a British team of cryptanalysts uh, that included Alan Turing at Bletchley Park, is sort of well known, right? We've all read books or, or seen films about that story, uh, but the Enigma machine sits at a long and fascinating history um, that's sort of riddled with inventions, um, prototypes, uh, and devices that were designed to uh, shroud or disguise sensitive information. Um, you know, we tend to think of encryption as a fairly modern strategy, uh, but there is a history behind it. Um, and you know things like block ciphers and pseudo random number generators, which are very much sort of of the moment, uh, actually sort of owe a lot to some of the early technologies like we'll be seeing today. Um, so in this episode, we'll be revisiting one of these early ancestors of Enigma, uh, and it's actually not a machine at all, but this book, right? Um, and I hope to convince you by the end of this episode that a book can function like a machine, right? It can be a kind of instrument. Um, so we'll start just by looking at the book itself. Um, you can see that CMU's copy of Della Porta's book on secret writing is bound in vellum, which is a kind of treated calf or cow skin that can be distinguished by uh, the texture and color. And if you look closely, you can actually see uh, where the hair follicles uh, the animal's fur was right before it was scraped away uh, when the vellum was prepared. The book is a quarto in size, which means that um, the individual sheets of paper that make it up were folded twice before being bound together, uh, making four leaves, which is where the term quarto comes from. Um, and this is actually a fairly recent acquisition to CMU. It was purchased last year uh, in the antiquarian book trade, and it joins um, are other books on the history of cryptography, which are many. Um, so John Battista della Porta, who wrote this book, um, sort of worked at a sort of transitional moment in the history of science. And what I mean by that is that, you know, while what Porta understood by the term science in his 16th and 17th century context, you know, at least it resembled our own kind of modern ideas about what qualifies as scientific investigation, um, you know, the strategies and precepts of experimental science were still in the process of being invented, right, in the, in the 16th and 17th century when Porta was working and writing. Um, 
you know, and this is this is one reason why I find Porta so fascinating, right? He sort of sits between worlds and works and writes at the cusp of what is typically seen as the beginning of modern scientific inquiry, right? Um, he was born in 1535 and died in 1615, so he's almost exactly a generation older than Galileo and Kepler, for instance. Um, you know, and I think this is quite sad in some ways, right? Porta knew by the end of his life that the winds were changing, right? He knew Galileo personally and recognized him for the sort of brilliant upstart that he was. Uh, and you can't help assuming, like when you read about Porta, that he knew kind of which way things were headed, right? His brand of science was sort of on the way out. Um, Porta practiced a kind of scientific investigation that was known at the time as natural magic. Uh, and he wasn't just a kind of dabbler in the field, and there were many dabblers in this field. He was almost its high priest, right? His first um, and most successful book uh, was kind of the sort of reference work, the Encyclopedia on Na Natural Magic. In fact, it was titled Natural Magic, magic uh, and it was uh, published in 1558. And again, kind of in a vastly expanded form in 1589. Um, and as I said, it's, it was uh, almost certainly Porta's most popular book. It sold incredibly well. Um, the idea, the guiding idea behind Porta's sort of natural magic was that scientific learning in its most advanced state amounted to a form of magic, right? That required a kind of occult knowledge and spiritual insight that only someone like Porta could offer, right? They had studied for decades, that's what it required. Um, of course, you know, Galileo and Galileo's successor, ex successors rightly scoffed at this kind of mystical science. Uh, but it's also what makes Porta so fascinating, right? In many ways, Porta represents the last generation of scientists that could claim an almost universal knowledge of the natural world, even if that universal knowledge was somewhat flawed, right, or incomplete. Um, but nevertheless, Porta believed that intense and prolonged scientific investigation could reveal or disclose a kind of theory of everything, right, unifying all the various branches of learning into a single crystallized truth. Um, and in search of this singular truth, Porta wrote broadly across disciplines, right? Uh, including works on optics, psychology, horticulture, chemistry, and of course, uh, cryptography. Um, for Porta, scientific knowledge was as much a source of wonder as it was of certainty, which I think is, is a, a sentiment that was very much of his moment. Um, so Porta even established an institute that was dedicated to drawing out the mysteries of nature and science. Uh, and he actually called this um, group that met at his home in Naples the Academia dei Segreti, right? The Academy of Secrets, uh, which is widely considered to be the earliest scientific institute in the Western world. Um, so like I said, this academy would meet at Porta's house in Naples, uh, through the 1570s, but it was actually eventually closed by the Inquisition. Um, so in retrospect, of course, um, we know that science took a different path, right? Away from Porta's ideas of universal secrets and natural magic uh, and toward Galileo's mathematical certainty, certainties, right? Mathematical science. Um, and after Galileo, science became increasingly specialized and compartmentalized uh, which was kind of the opposite of the science that Porta wanted to build and sought, right, uh, during his life. Um, but the posthumous decline of Porta's reputation shouldn't suggest that he was peripheral um, or somehow insignificant in early modern, modern scientific circles, right? Far from it. Um, in fact, his reputation was almost at its height in the early um, 17th century. So, after Porta's academy was forcibly closed by the Catholic Church, um, a second academy founded by the Roman nobleman Federico Cesi took its name from one of Porta's books. Um, and this is a fairly well-known academy, uh, but Cesi's academy was called the Academia dei Lincei, or the Academy of the Lynx-Eyed, uh, which was named for the mythological figure of Linceus who was sort of known for his exceptional eyesight um, and exceptionally acute vision, right? Um, so the Academy of the Lynxed Eye took its emblem uh, actually from an image of a lynx 
that was found on the title page of the first edition of Porta's Natural Magic. Uh, and this was in part because the lynx, um, like Linsaeus, the mythological figure, was believed to be a particularly observant animal. Uh, and of course, careful observation was the sort of foundation of the scientific method. So, um, you know, I think that's kind of interesting to realize that, you know, people like Galileo and Chesi uh, were consciously borrowing from Porta's sort of older um, vision of science in crafting this new sort of observational method that we've sort of inher inherited uh, in modern science today. So um, returning to the book, though, uh, when we page through it, you can see that it's laid out in a fairly conventional way for books of the period. Um, so after the title page, you get this uh, sort of prefatory letter, which dedicates the work to Henry Percy, who was an English nobleman. Uh, and it's signed by the work's editor, uh, who was Giacomo Castelvetro here in, in Latin. Um, and he was he was editing this this printing of Porta's book. Um, there were other printings, as I mentioned, uh, but he likely edited this and had it printed without Porta's permission, right? Um, about which I might have more to say later. Um, but I want to I want to pause on this letter because it reveals the kind of person that would have bought and read this book in particular. Uh, and you know this this is the kind of thing that uh, we can learn from the material that's printed before and around the text of an early printed book, right? Namely, you know, who was buying it and what did the author or the editor, or maybe the printer, what did they hope to accomplish by distributing it um, to readers? Um, so the editor of this book, or at least this edition, uh, Giacomo Castrovetro, was an Italian convert to Protestantism who had fled to England to escape um, anti-Protestant persecution in Italy. Uh, and after he arrived, he quickly sort of gained favor at the English court uh, and was eventually appointed as the Italian tutor for James VI of Scotland. Uh, in fact, just a year after this book was published. Um, and this was fairly good timing. It was a significant position to gain because, of course, James VI of Scotland would become James I of England uh, after Queen Elizabeth's death uh, and the end of the Tudor monarchy in 1603. Uh, so he was a fairly well-connected guy. Um, interestingly, in his letter to Henry Percy at the beginning of the book, Castrovetra explains that he funded and sponsored the printing of Porta's book on cryptography because copies of the first edition, which were printed, which was printed in 1563, had become so scarce, right? So plainly, there was a demand for the cryptographic techniques that Porta's work describes. Um, you know, there was kind of a simmering curiosity about methods of secret communication, uh, and Porta's book was unusual in its kind of detailed treatment of the subject, right? If you wanted to learn about how to communicate secretly, to use ciphers, um, to use cryptography, uh, this was the book to buy, right? So um, the first point that we learn from the letter prefacing um, Porta's book is that Castelvetro's me uh, me motive, right, for getting this published is, um, you know, partly commercial. He recognized a demand um, for a increasingly difficult to find book, and he sought to meet this demand by funding a new edition. Um, so this, the second interesting thing about this letter is um, its intended recipient, right? Henry Percy, uh, who was the ninth Earl of Northumberland. Uh, he was sort of a wealthy and influential figure in Elizabethan England, uh, and also a kind of strange character who, much like Porta, kind of towed the line that separated magic and science in the period. Um, he was even known as the Wizard Earl for his well-known experiments with magnetism, electricity, and alchemy. So, you know, I think Henry Percy's association with Porta's book um, not only underscores Porta's reputation for arcane and occult learning in the period, uh, it also tells us that Henry Percy and his associates, right, his circle, were the, were the intended audience of this new edition um, you know, that was ushered through the press by Castelvetro. Um, and certainly Castelvetro addressed it to Henry Percy in the hopes of sort of garnering his favor and sort of joining the circle. Um, so thereafter, right, after the um, introductory letter, we have an introduction to the readers, ad lectores. Um, but after that, um, you know, you get an index, which is helpful. 
Um, let's page through this. All right, it's alphabetized, which is nice. Uh, but then the book begins, um, and it sort of treats its subject uh, in sort of useful categories and runs through the definitions meant to kind of demystify uh, what Porta calls the art of secret letters or the art of secret writing. So you can see that chapter one here of book one uh, is titled, you know, what are secret letters? What is secret writing? Um, I'm going to let's see, skip ahead a bit to get to the interesting bits of this book. Uh, which we'll be spending the rest uh, of this sort of episode exploring, uh, which I'll try to explain. Uh, so most of these appear in the middle of the book. I have them marked. Um, so there are three of them. Here's one. All right. There's another. And there's the third. So um, we're actually going to spend our time looking at the this one here, the third one. So you can see that it's made up of kind of two concentric dials or these circles, right? Um, which are made up of cells. Uh, the inner circle has a modified Latin alphabet um, that's obviously scrambled. It's in no apparent order. Uh, and then the outermost circle has cells containing Roman numerals uh, from one to 20. Um, so you know, the, the observant among you uh, will notice that there's this sort of void at the middle, at the center of the dial, uh, a kind of blank circle. Um, and it seems like something is missing, right? So, so what is this thing? Uh, how is it used? What was it meant to impart to the reader? Um, so it turns out that Porta's book is not only a book about cryptography, um, it's also a cryptographic in instrument, and this is what's known as a cipher disk, right? Which is a kind of paper enciphering tool that revolves to encode a message. Um, one thing I'll just talk about, you know, what's going on on the page here briefly. One thing I love about this particular cipher disk uh, is the figures that surround it, right? You can see that there's these sort of two uh, sort of animal female figures with you know, lion legs, lion heads at least. Um, you know, and these, of course, these strange hybrids are sphinxes, which I think, you know, they're so appropriate in a book on cryptography, given that the sphinx was the riddler, riddler of classical mythology. And so I think it's kind of fitting that they're guarding Porta's cipher disc, cipher instrument uh, on its side. You know, they're kind of guarding its secrets. So to return to the question of how this thing works, right? So it, it turns out that there's some assembly required. Uh, paper instruments like this that appear in books are known as volvels, uh, which is a term that comes from the Latin verb volvere or rollere to turn. Uh, and I hope for an obvious reason, right? They actually revolve, you spin them. Uh, so some volvels are incredibly complex. Uh, they involve you know, several overlapping slips of paper that are usually all tacked together with a bit of metal, you know, a metal pin or a piece of thread. Um, and I think it's no stretch to describe these as one of the first mechanical calculators, right? They, they commonly appear in works on astronomy in the Renaissance and can be used to predict uh, or calculate the position of a planet, for example, at a given point in the year, you know, and other things like that that, that sort of uh, are, are, are a seed to calculation, right? So what Porta has done is adopted that technology uh, to make an encrypting device for his readers to use. Of course, we've already noticed that this cipher disk, this Volvel, um, is incomplete, right? And if you turn to the end of the book, uh, you'll see so you'll see why, right? So the centerpieces um, were actually printed on a separate page at the back. Um, and uh, I call these indexes or indices because they indicate the position or the setting of the cipher disk. Um, so yeah, they were printed separately. And they were actually intended to be removed, to be cut out very carefully by the book's buyer, uh, by the book's reader, and actually mounted uh, at the appropriate points in the book, right? So you'd cut these out and you'd sort of pin them or stitch them into place so they'd spin at the center of the cipher discs. Um, and I, I love that these have been labeled, right? One, two, and three, I think by the printer. Um, and that, those numbers tell you which uh, volvel, which cipher disk they belong to. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind. We'll have our own example of a functioning cipher disk to work with later. 
uh, but I'll, tur I'll turn back to the one we were looking at earlier that's missing uh, that centerpiece. Um, no, of course, in some ways, it's it's kind of disappointing that CM CMU's copy wasn't assembled in 1591 when it was printed uh, and purchased, uh, because that tells us that this book, you know, wasn't exactly used as intended, right? It's early reader or early readers never engage in the kind of ciphering that Porta's book invites and demands, right? And we'll have to sit with that disappointment because we can't, unfortunately, cut up this copy and put it together ourselves. Um, what we can do, though, is make copies and assemble our own facsimiles of Porta's cipher disk to learn how it worked. Um, so to do that, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, uh, I've scanned this page right, I just, that I just showed you and cre uh, created a printable kit uh, that you can download here, and I'll, I'll link that again. Um, so once that's assembled, this is, this is sort of what you have. This is what it looks like. Um, so, and you can see that the centerpiece rotates. I've used a brass pin here. Um, and the kit that uh, is in the PDF also includes a blank index. So these symbols, these, these strange sigla that are around the circumference of the index, the centerpiece, uh, those cells are blank. So you can actually make up your own uh, alphabet of hieroglyphics or symbols to work with. Um, but we'll use uh, Porta's cipher disk, his alphabet of hieroglyphs, uh, to demonstrate how it works. Um, okay, so to begin, you know, you, you cut out the index, uh, you tack it to the center of the cipher disk, uh, and then once that's done, the, the center disk should rotate freely, right? So make sure that's that's loose. Sometimes they get kind of sticky. Um, so you know, let's let's give it a try, right? Um, so you know, looking at the book uh, itself, Della Porta actually gives a number of examples, right? So there's there's his hieroglyphic alphabet, and you're meant to use the cipher disk to decipher um, what's written, sort of in this ornamental frame. Um, so this one is quite long. It's also in Latin. I think few of us read Latin. So we're going to make up our own shorter secret message. Um, so the way this works is that for every letter in the message, either the original plain text uh, that you want to encode or the encoded message you want to decipher, decode, uh, you advance the wheel uh, one step clockwise for, clockwise for each character or letter, right? starting at position number one which is there, all right? So starting with the index at one, um, notice how there's a little hand at the center that shows you where it's pointing, which is quite helpful. Um, so we'll, de we'll decode the first symbol and I'm gonna put up an enciphered message here. So um, let's, let's, let's begin. So we're at one, uh, that's where we start. The first symbol is uh, this sort of open circle um, which leads to a number of possibilities, right? We have F, H, and I. So let's just let's just jot all of those down uh, for the time being, because we'll kind of have to work through the variant readings of the cipher text. So what did I say? So we have uh, F, H. And I. Okay, so it's going to be one of those. And notice that in repeating that hieroglyphic, um, that's sort of adding security um, to Della Porta's cipher system. Uh, when you repeat symbols like that, generally the cipher system is more secure uh, if you're encoding your plain text um, under sort of a rep repetitive uh, symbolic alphabet. Um, Okay, so that's that's the first, it's going to be one of those, that's the first character, and we advance the wheel one step, um, and the next symbol is, again, uh, an open circle. Okay, so uh, it's either, let's see, S, R, or E. Okay, it's going to be one of those. All right, so we'll, we'll rotate it again until we're in position three, right? Let me make sure I'm lined up here. Yeah, so we're in position three. The next symbol um, is, oh gosh, an open circle. Okay, so we're, we're, we're sticking with that repeated figure. So it's either G, 
position four. So I'll put that down here. Uh, L or V, right? And notice that in, in Delaporta's modified Latin alphabet, um, at least on this disc, there is no U. Uh, and you know this is probably too much information, but the V also function as a functions as a U in the Latin, Latin alphabet because there was no U originally in the Latin alphabet. Um, so if you want to encrypt a U, uh, you would use the V in, in its place. Okay, so um, that's the third letter. Um, advancing once more uh, to the fourth position, uh, which is the fourth letter. Okay, let's go ahead and find it. It's this this little shape there. And luckily here, there are only one of those, so that can only be L. All right. Uh, last letter, advance once more to position five. It's a five-letter word. Uh, we're looking for an open circle in a square. So there it is. O. Right? Okay, so now we have to sort of figure out which reading of these three letter blocks makes the most sense. So I see something here. Right? So the encrypted message is just greeting us. It says hello, right? Um, so the cool thing about ciphers uh, or Porta's cipher and cipher disk is that they work in either direction, right? So say, for example, you wanted to encrypt the plain text, which is hello, um, hello. You again start one, um, and you do the same thing just in reverse, right? So with the wheel at one, you look for H. There's that open circle. So you would encode that as an open circle. You advance it one step. You look for E. There it is. Sure enough, another open circle. Advance again. You're going to look for L. Another open circle. Advance again. You look for O, right? Or another L, sorry. Uh, and you have that strange symbol there, which I'll attempt to draw. Okay, and then finally, one more position. You're looking for the letter O, and you get a box enclosing a circle, right? So that's that's our original string of sort of hieroglyphic uh, letters. So that's that's kind of how it works. It's nice in a way that, you know, the same instrument is used to encrypt and decrypt, right? Now, one disadvantage of this system is that after you um, encode a message, right, you or someone else who receives that message has to reverse the process um, using the exact same cipher wheel. Like the only way to read enciphered messages uh, using the cipher system quickly is to actually have <coughs> a cipher disk on hand. So that's kind of an inherent flaw in the system, right? Uh, if this cipher disk fell into your enemy's hands, right, she could potentially decipher it just as easily as the recipient. So that's Porta's cipher disk. Um, and I invite you to visit the online exhibition that accompanies this video. I'll link that here. Um, there you'll find more information and instructional exercises on how to use Porta's cipher disk. And of course, um, you can print out your own facsimile and use it um, however you like. Thanks, and I look forward to the next episode. <laughs>